I'm sure we all appreciate sequels. I mean, it is pretty hard to screw up a continuation to a story that was rated highly or sold well enough to warrant one. And although they can vary in quality, there are a lot of times where a sequel will come out and give us a far better experience than we ever could have imagined from the original. Think Halo 2, Black Ops 2, Modern Warfare 2, Borderlands 2, Assassin's Creed 2, Too Fast, Too Furious, Rocky 2, Spider-Man 2, The Dark Knight, Empire Strikes Back, Jurassic Park, yeah, okay, maybe not that one. But one that stands above all of these examples as a sequel that truly redefined a series, perhaps even the mecha genre as a whole, and did every single thing the original was trying to accomplish but better is Zeta Gundam. Zeta Gundam is the sequel to the now esteemed 1979 Mobile Suit Gundam. And I'm going to explore how Zeta improved upon the original and why it is widely considered one of the greatest entries in the entire Gundam franchise. From its captivating story and complex characters to its innovative mecha design and political landscape, Zeta Gundam is a near perfect Gundam experience. While Mobile also Gundam laid the foundations for the franchise, its narrative is relatively straightforward and linear. Zeta Gundam on the other hand takes a much more ambitious approach, weaving together a complex web of political intrigue, personal drama and moral dilemma. The result is a compelling and thought provoking narrative that challenges the viewer to think about the consequences of war and the true costs of fighting for one's beliefs. Which if you were new to the franchise and weren't really aware, that is all Gundam is about. After the commercial success of the original Gundam selling a ludicrous amount of merchandise, Sunrise gave Tomino, Gundam's creator, a big old budget and the green light to go absolutely ham with his next series. And did he ever do just that? We are thrown back into the Universal Century year 0087, seven years after the galaxy was devastated by the One Year War fought between the Earth Federation and the Principality of Zeon. Post-war, after the Federation's victory, a task force named the Titans was formed to wipe out any remaining Zeon remnants. But slowly, over time, that initial goal is soured, and the Titans stoop lower and lower, beginning to forcibly take control of the space colonies, in turn oppressing the space noids who are the citizens of space once again. And who would have thought that had caused them to rebel? A rebel task force made up of Earth Federation and Xeon soldiers alike, known as the AUG, anti-Earth Union government, fight back against the Titans in an attempt to stop their tyranny once and for all. Enter our protagonist, Camille, a teen who understandably hates the Titans, and he's bitch boy of a father that works for them, but we'll come back to that later. Fate has it that his path crosses with a striking blonde man named Quattro Bagina, who looks awfully familiar and helps him steal his father's Gundam Mark II, joining the rebellion in the process. Camille becomes a member of the Argama crew, basically a white base 2.0 from the original series, and he pilots the Mark II to help the rebel cause. Soon after, Camille loses both of his parents to the Titans, which further strengthens his resolve against them, although he's much more sympathetic to his mother's death than his father's demise. Hilda Bidan was used as a political bargaining tool and unfortunately died in the process, right at the moment when Camille thought he had saved her, which again clearly solidified his position in the rebel forces if his mind wasn't made up already, whereas his father was a cheating scum. Camille goes through a lot right from the get-go, losing his parents one after another so quickly and then being propelled into a rebellion, although mainly by his own volition, and slowly over time he grows, matures, and begins to uncover more of his new type abilities. Throughout the 50 episode run of Zeta, we see Camille's struggles as a pilot and the ways in which the war impacts him personally, as well as everyone else close to him, whether or not they be alive or dead by the end. But we'll talk a little bit more about Camille, one of my personal favorite Gundam protagonists, a little bit later on. I'm gonna properly start this dissection of Zeta with the negatives, because what better of a way is there to drive engagement on a YouTube video than to give negative opinions on a beloved series. And don't get me wrong, I love Zeta too, but it's not a perfect series. First things first, Zeta Gundam is confusing at the start. For the first, say, I don't know, 10 episodes or so, I wouldn't blame you if you had 
no real idea what was going on. Everything gets flipped on its head from the original, where the Earth Federation subsidy, the Titans, are our antagonists. And the faction we follow is the AEUG. And the thing is, it's already a little bit confusing because we would be used to, you know, the Federation being the side that we're on, or the good guys, so to speak, even though there aren't any good or bad guys, but you get where I'm going with this. Then you pair that flip in our expectations with characters like Captain Bright, who is still wearing his Earth Federation uniform, even though now he's technically fighting against the Federation. Then on top of that, you have a bunch of different mobile suit designs being used by both sides, so it's, it's really hard to separate each side and what's actually going on. However, this confusion is a really unique position to be in and can actually make for a strong positive for the series in a rewatch. Because once you wrap your head around it, that second viewing is far more enjoyable and you see little nuances that you never would have picked up to begin with when you were still trying to understand what's actually happening. My next gripe with Zeta is that it's just too long. I firmly believe you cut Zeta down about 15 episodes. You know what, let's say 14 episodes. You could fit everything essential about this series in 36 episodes or three 12 episode seasons, which is, you know, pretty standard for anime these days. I do get why it is as long as it is. It was the 80s, it was aired weekly. Tamino was given a 50 episode budget to work with from Sunrise and they continued to sell merchandise. So why would they cut a series, you know, 10 episodes or so short so a guy 40 years later wouldn't complain about the pacing. Nonetheless, in particular, there was like a 10 episode gap between episode 21 and 31 that was just painful to get through. Now, don't get me wrong, there were still a lot of important things happening in this 10 episode stretch. There were some even character defining moments like Rokoa first meeting Soroko, the assassination of Commodore Blex and what that means for Char going forward, as well as Camille mourning four. But despite all of that, this section was still easily the slowest part of the show. It would have been easy enough to cut a bunch of episodes from Zeta and fit all of these important story beats in different places without ruining any of the payoff and gaining an overall better pace in the process. To give you some context on how slow it became and how bored I got in this section, I recently watched a seven hour video on the whole of God of War Ragnarok's story in one sitting. Whereas it took me a bit over a month to get through this 10 episode section of Zeta. Do I think Ragnarok has a better story? Probably not. However, I was engaged the entire time and that really does say something. Another particularly frustrating occurrence is the frequency of female pilots essentially being used as plot devices, only dying so that their male counterparts like Jared and even Camille at times can get crazy power-ups and win the fight they're in, or at least escape alive, I guess. I don't particularly love any character being used in that way at all throughout any series, and it's not exclusive to Zeta, but as a silver lining, at least a couple of these deaths really go to highlight the irony of Jared's character, but we'll touch on him a little bit later. My final gripe is that I'm not a huge fan of the whole transforming gimmick. It was popularized by Macross and probably really helped to sell toys because what kid wouldn't want a transforming robot? Two toys in one. And while the Zeta Gundam in particular really has grown on me, personally, I just prefer to keep my Transformers and my Gundam separate. But adding extra armor and weapons is always appreciated. More things to go boom and more armor pieces and boosters to shed off in the space yeah, that's cool. Now we can get to the good stuff. Despite its debatably confusing beginning, Zeta Gundam manages to iron out all of the creases and pull you through an absolute wonder of an 80s space opera by the end. These set pieces are gorgeous. The soundtrack is honestly impeccable. And if you're a sucker for that sinking, empty feeling in your chest after you've watched a fantastic series with a soul crushing ending, then Zeta is a series for you. Zeta Gundam's story doesn't necessarily follow any arcs like a traditional anime would, but there are, let's say, five key sections the story goes through. Starting with Camille joining the AUG and fighting against the Titans, the descent to Earth and the battle that ensues, the return to space and Axis Zeon's appearance, Char's speech, and the final 
three-way conflict. But instead of just telling you what happens, I'm going to explore this story through its most compelling aspect, through its characters. Because Zeta Gundam is very clearly a character-driven story before anything else. While the original series introduced some memorable characters like the stoic Amuro Ray and the hot-headed Char Anzabal, Zeta Gundam takes its characters to the next level. Because Zeta Gundam is fundamentally a different series. The original had its cast fighting in an ideological battle against Zeon, whereas in Zeta, most of the conflict is personal, differing from character to character. Camille quickly gets wrapped up in the conflict because he's impulsive and decided to punch Jared in the face after making fun of his name. Char, or Quattro, is doing everything he can to avoid responsibility and live his life freely. Far would go to the ends of the earth for Camille. Rokoa is constantly putting her life on the line for some sort of feeling of redemption or just validation. All of these moving pieces come together to make up the AUG and make Zeta all the more interesting. Camille Bidan is a much more relatable and, in my opinion, likeable character than Amuro Ray. While well, yes, he starts off as an immature, naive, almost frustrating to watch, hot-headed teenager, like this dude is seriously a menace at the beginning. He slowly and continuously changes and adapts throughout Zeta, seeing his family and those close to him get torn away, and being forced to end so many lives himself in the war transforms him into a battle-hardened pilot by the end, but not just that, overall a better person by the end. He really wisens up, becomes more tolerant, and starts thinking more about other people and the future of humankind after the war, instead of just being impulsive and feeding his own ego like he did at the start of the series. And no character helps him push through these boundaries more than his mentor, Quattro Pagina. Upon joining the AUG, Quattro takes Camille under his wing, and a majority of the battles in this series will include him in his, of course, golden Hyakushiki, with Camille by his side in the Gundam Mark II and later in the Zeta. The ball really gets rolling between these two and the plot as a whole on their first trip down to Earth. And just a small thing that I really appreciate is that there is a whole episode dedicated to this traversal down to Earth. Before ever watching Gundam, I never even thought of this as an issue. I just figured mobile suits were so powerful they'd have no problem entering and exiting the Earth's atmosphere at will. But obviously that's pretty far from the truth, at least at this stage in the show. So it becomes a whole operation. And obviously it won't be easy because the Titans are going to put up a fight. I mean, why would they let the AUG just go down to Earth and smack up their home base without any resistance. Which means we get an entire battle choreographed on the premise of entering the Earth's atmosphere, which only adds to the tension of the battle. Think of it like playing a battle royale like Warzone, and the circle is closing in, but instead of the gas closing in on you, it is the looming pressure of burning up in the atmosphere if you don't pull your inflatable balloon thing soon enough. So we've got a bunch of people fighting as much as they can to the last minute that they can while simultaneously trying not to burn up upon re-entry. And well, a lot of people don't make it, just like my squad in Warzone. He's just like me for real. And soon after this goes down, we are reintroduced to a bunch of familiar faces from the original, including Amuro, who at this point is a shell of his former self. He's basically being kept in like a witness protection situation by the Earth Federation after serving his time in the One Year War, because they know what he's capable of as a new type and quite frankly, they're afraid of him. So rather than try to use him, it is in their best interest to keep him miles away from a mobile suit. And he's kind of of content with that. Amuro is still grieving Lala's death all these years later and has no interest in returning to space. You know who's not content with that decision? Basically everyone else around him. With Beltochika literally telling Amuro he's been asleep for the past seven years and now is the time for him to wake up. And when Char finally crosses his path, he remarks on how these kids, the next generation, are still out there fighting and wonders how that sensation doesn't make Amuro want to get out there and fight too. But in the end, it's Frau Bo who manages to reignite Amuro's fighting spirit. So he takes Katz under his wing and gets out there to help the AUG fight on Earth. Amuro still refuses to go to space, but that doesn't mean he's going to continue sitting around doing nothing. And that moment when him and Char finally meet again as the sun sets behind them is like something out of a movie. Their bromance is truly something special. Taking a bit of a course correction back to Camille for a minute, this stretch of time on Earth is one of the 
biggest character defining moments for him. Not only does he get to spend time with and learn from the apparently glorified action hero Amuro has become, he also gets to meet one of the most important characters to him in this series, a cyber new type named for Murasame. Now I've already briefly mentioned new types earlier in the video, but if you're somewhat new to Gundam, this word probably means nothing to you. So to boil it down, new types are considered the next generation of human evolution. At this point they're quite rare and typically appear amongst people born and raised in space. New types have a unique ability, we'll say, of a heightened state of mental awareness, allowing them to understand each other on a far deeper level than you know, normal humans ever could. A byproduct of this keen awareness allows them to have near superhuman piloting abilities, detecting other new types and feeling hostile emotions pointed towards them, which allows them to dodge shots and attacks that you wouldn't think were possible. Stronger new types also exude an emotional pressure, which can affect other new types around, similar to spiritual pressure in Bleach, but not quite to that magic degree. This byproduct of enhanced combat capabilities is what leads to the creation of cyber new types and mobile suits that can take advantage of their abilities. Camille first meets four in Hong Kong. Unbeknownst to them, they are literally fighting on opposite sides and actually fought the previous day with the Psycho Gundam and the Gundam Mark II. Being new types, they are quickly drawn to each other and Camille falls head over heels for her. Four reciprocates those feelings, but in the end has no other choice but to fight him. Both from the influence of her Psycho Gundam, which taps into her cyber new type abilities, and the intense longing for her memory, which the Titans hold as a dangling carrot in front of her, saying that they'll give her memory back so long as she fights against the AEUG. The scenes before they get to that point are downright Gorgeous though. Seeing the two wander the city and the amazing soundtrack playing as they do just really sets the scene. With Camille really opening up to Four about why he hates his, you know, girly name and the way he felt he always had to prove himself as a man because of it, which goes to explain his rash behavior early on. That's what he thinks a man is and what a man does, but ironically, despite being mentored by both Char and Amaro, it ends up being the women in his life that make him the man he is by the end. And these beautiful scenes of Camille opening up like that make how the two end up all the more heartbreaking. They fight and Camille does everything in his power to try and free fall from the Titan's grasp, but he just isn't strong enough. In the end, as Camille's trying to get back to space, it ends up being Four, who changes her mind and sacrifices herself to get him there. Four changes him for the better, and the grief he goes through here is intense. At this point in the show, the Zeta Gundam design he was actually developing himself is developed, but he doesn't exactly have the motivation to fight, and even rejects the notion of him being a new type entirely, acting like it's a cop-out or something. Emma Sheen, a former Titan pilot who joined the AEUG and ends up becoming one of Camille's main female role models, scolds him for his actions since returning to space, telling him that he's still being easy on himself as the victim who lost his parents. Camille from the start of Zeta Gundam probably would have snapped back at her, or just downright ignored her, but he simply says that now he thinks more about the pilots he's ended up killing. At the end of the day, they all have families too, and any one of those pilots could have been four to someone else. Nonetheless, the conflict marches on and he inevitably gets back out there. And we slowly get to learn more about another AUG pilot, Rokoa Lond. She's a pilot that fights like she has absolutely nothing to lose, but at the same time, something to prove. First and foremost, we learn she feels like she needs to redeem herself after being bailed out by Camille back on Earth, because the last thing that she wants is to be in debt to a man. So she takes on increasingly dangerous missions, one of which involves infiltrating a Titan ship, the Jupitris, captained by none other than Paptimus Sirocco. I say none other as if he's been like foreshadowed throughout this video, but yeah. He's a big deal. He's been lurking in the Titan's shadows since the beginning, but now he starts to come to the forefront and becomes one of our final 
major antagonists. Soroko is a powerful and extremely charismatic new type. It's implied that his abilities aid him in the manipulation of people and in particular women. And of course, Rokoa isn't immune to this. And from the second that they first meet, the seed of her defection from the AUG is planted. And ironically, at the end of that mission, she manages to escape the Jupitress thanks to Soroko choosing not to pursue her, being saved by a man once again. And as we progress through the story, the Titans just get worse and worse, doing things like attempting to gas a colony while deliberately ignoring their surrender just to send a message of how powerful they are. This is the faction Rokoa chooses to defect to, but you've got to remember, she's more so following Soroko than she is the Titans. Does that make it any better? Well, no, but it does explain a lot about why she chose to leave the AUG. Before every mission, she would leave her room on the Argama as clean of a slate as possible. Not necessarily because she was planning on leaving, but more so because she doesn't want anything there left waiting for her. Every time she ejects in a mobile suit, she doesn't plan on returning. And out of everyone, Quattro recognises this. We see the two of them flirt a little bit, but at the end of the day, he isn't what she needs. He isn't the one that she is going to come back to. And even despite her advances, he doesn't reciprocate her feelings. It's a perfectly valid human emotion to want someone to connect with and have someone to come back to. And when Rokoa can't find that person in Quattro, she seeks it out elsewhere. Now granted, the opportunity to join the Titan was kind of handed to her on a silver platter, as everyone in the AUG thought she was dead. But at the end of the day, no matter how easy or seamless of a choice it might have been, it was still the choice she made, and was one of the very few choices she actually made for herself in quite some time. And the thing is, whether or not Soroko actually reciprocated feelings for her or not didn't really matter. Even if he was just using her, at that point in time, he is what she needed. Being recognised in that way was what she needed. And that stability and resolve in his goal was what she needed. Unlike the indecisive Quattro who is still clinging on to his freedom, which makes the revelation in her death all the more tragic. During the final battle of the series, Rokoa and Emma duke it out, and their two conflicting ideologies come to a head. We've got Emma, who takes her role as a soldier above all else, whereas Rokoa decided her feelings and femininity are going to take priority. She is a woman first and foremost, not a soldier. Now, I'm not a woman, so it's not something I can particularly talk about with a lot of depth. I wouldn't have a single clue what she's going through at this point, and that holds true for her final words. Lieutenant Emma, understand me. Men are so involved in their fighting. They think of women as mere tools, sometimes even not knowing anything other than to disgrace them. And the key word we're looking at here is Azukashime, or disgrace, and in Japanese, it's a common euphemism for rape, which in the end just explains so much about Rokoa's character. It explains her constant search for a stable male figure, even going so far as to defect from the AUG to follow Soroko, and explains why she was just so gutted after finding out Quattro didn't reciprocate her feelings. It's not like she believed in the Titan's cause and wanted to kill all these innocent people. And there are multiple instances where she hopes the Argama will come and stop her because of this. It's a real shame this insinuation, this euphemism was lost in translation because it really changes so much around her character. And I only coincidentally found this out from an eight year old comment on Reddit that only had like 40 upvotes. So it wouldn't shock me if a lot of other people didn't know what this line implied either. But like I said, no matter how much it changes things, it isn't something that I can personally speak on with a lot of depth. So I'm curious, if you watching right now are a woman who has completed Zeta Gundam, what are your thoughts on Rokoa? Do you think she's a well-written female character? Do you think her actions are justified? I'd be really interested to know. Now let's take it back and rewind a little because we did get a little bit ahead of ourselves here. We haven't even talked about Axis Eon yet. They are our third faction in this war that make things all the more interesting in our final act. On paper, Axis Eon is run by the next successor of the Zabi family, Mineva Zabi. To learn more about the Zabi family, importance, watch the Origin and the original Mobile Suit Gundam. But the TLDR of it is, they are the founding royal family of the Principality of Zeon. So a 
pretty important lineage. Now, Minerva's Abbey is only a child, so Axezion is primarily run by her regent, Haman Khan, a plot point in Zoid's chaotic century would shamelessly steal 14 years later. After making their presence known, Zeon more or less fades into the background until the final confrontation. Moving forward, Camille and Char enter the Earth's atmosphere once again, with Char saved from being burnt up by the Zeta, which is just such a cool little nod back to the first entry we saw. Camille designed the Zeta himself, so he more than likely would have taken that first mission into consideration and ensured that the Zeta would be capable of an Earth re-entry on its own. And what they find once they sneak up on the Titan's base in Kilimanjaro is four alive. As a cyber new type, she's still going through some torturous testing, but Camille manages to set her free. However, the impact it's had on her mind still lingers. There are times where she'll remember Camille, but then there are also times where she'll be more subdued by the Psycho Gundam and chooses to fight against him instead. But Camille is determined not to lose her again. He's a different person now, a better pilot in a far superior mobile suit. But at the end of the day, it's still not enough. Because as soon as Four comes back to her senses, she's stripped away, being shot and killed by Jared in an attempt to save Camille. And man, did it ever hurt to hear Camille scream as he's clutching Four's lifeless body, whilst Char and Amaro lift him and the Zeta away from the explosions, commenting on how they've let the same thing happen again. Literally a mirror of what happened to Lala when she saved Char. The biggest difference is how Camille reacts. Once they get back to safety, Camille, while still carrying four, is calm and tells Char he won't be calling him by Lieutenant Quattro ever again. He'll have no choice but to be Char Arzabal from now on. It's at this point in the show, Camille has truly surpassed both of his mentors and is literally telling Char to his face that he will not let him hide behind that facade of Quattro anymore. It is time for him to step up, even if it costs him his freedom. Camille pushes back against them because He's seen how their generation has failed his. Amro Ray and Char Arnsabal, two of the most powerful and influential figures from the One Year War, just sat back and dicked around for the past seven years, which created the power vacuum that the Titans filled in and exploited, and is what led to history repeating itself once again, rendering all their efforts in the One Year War meaningless. Char respects Camille for calling him out on this. He clearly considers Camille a peer at this point, understands what he's saying and just tells him that he's right, then proceeds to finally take action. But before I talk about Char, I think it's finally an appropriate time to discuss Jared. Because at this point in the series, if we were to keep a tally, Camille and Jared have each killed two of each other's loved ones. Camille killing Lila and Moore, and Jared killing Camille's mother and four. I never really mentioned Lila and Moore because honestly, they're just some of the plot devices I mentioned in the negatives at the beginning. They aren't really proper fleshed out characters and are mainly used to fuel Jared's hatred for Camille. The irony is, is no matter how many great pilots Jared gets paired up with and die in the process, he continues to fail upwards, climbing the ranks of the Titans, inevitably being shoved so far into the deep end that he unceremoniously dies in the final fight. Yeah, the rival to Camille was never really that great of a pilot. And when push finally came to shove and there was nobody left around to protect him, he just becomes another quick casualty of war, which is pretty fitting for his character to say the least. He was a stubborn soldier with an endless ambition that could not handle the heat and just didn't get out of the kitchen. Back to Char and it is time for him to take center stage, being a clown if you will. The infamous Quattro Begina of the AEUG reveals himself to be Char Arnsabal on a widely viewed live broadcast. Not only that, but he also reveals himself to be the son of Zeon Daikun and reprimands both the Titans and Axis Zeon. Char delivers an amazing speech that does far more for the war effort and the political climate than he ever could have done piloting a mobile suit. He exposes the actions of the Titans to the general population and the politicians of the Earth Federation who really just sat back and let them go can't just let the Titans do what they want anymore, especially now that the 
general public knows what's happening. And that point is further emphasized by the fighting going on outside that Bertolt Chica manages to capture, showing how far the Titans are willing to go to stop the broadcast, even putting innocent lives at risk in the process. We immediately see the impacts of this speech too, with one of the pilots fighting alongside Jared, defecting after learning what the Titans have actually been up to. Not only does Char expose these factions, he puts a further emphasis on his, and by extension his father's belief that the world is infected by humanity. And for it to heal, people need to stop letting their souls be weighed down by gravity and transcend into space. From his perspective, that transition is the most logical and natural progression necessary for both Earth and humanity to continue to flourish. After the speech, Char can't go back to being Quattro anymore, to anyone. He's no longer incognito. He's finally stood up, put himself on a pedestal and taken some responsibility. Char and Camille head back to space in an awesome little mission in and of itself, finally working as equals trying to get back to the Argama, which is currently under attack. Once they return, from this point on, Captain Bright tries to mentor Char on how to be a leader from the back rather than a pilot from the front. As now, his life and stature as a political figure is far more important than his ability as a pilot. Unfortunately, this is never a lesson he truly learns though. Camille is finally embracing being a new type, choosing to leave gravity behind in order to preserve Four's memory. And while stationed on Colony 13, he meets a girl named Rosamie, who claims to be his little sister. Unbeknownst to them, and technically her at this point as well, she's another cyber new type that has been brainwashed by the Titans into thinking she is Camille's little sister so that she can infiltrate the Argama crew. Soon after she manages to do just that, she hijacks a mobile suit to actually try and help Camille, but sees the inside of a colony that's recently been destroyed by Rokoa, which triggers some repressed memories and snaps her out of her delusion, remembering that her sole mission is to destroy the Zeta Gundam. Which really gets to Camille, this is just another person, like Rokoa, that is lost to the Titans. When Camille fights here, he pilots the Zeta effortlessly and brutally. The animation and fight choreography at this point in the series is honestly some of the best it's been, and it really goes to show how far he's come from the start. The guy is now wiping out Hyzax like they are absolutely nothing, ironically saying how could you kill people so easily in response to them gassing a colony while simultaneously killing them so easily. I guess in his mind at this point it's justified. I wasn't lying when I said he became a battle hardened pilot by the end. We'll come back to Rosamie very shortly because now it is time for the AUG to negotiate with Axis Zeon. The Titans have created a colony laser which is as big and intimidating as it sounds and is now turning the tides of the war. So Brighton Char go to make a deal with Haman Khan. So long as she takes out the laser, Axis Eon can claim all of side 3 and become the ruler of all space noids. Which she accomplishes, because she is a badass in her own right, but not only that, she thinks a couple of steps ahead and only disables the laser, knowing full well it can be repaired for Xeon's use later. The AUG is then absorbed into Axis Xeon and our final battle crawls ever closer. Working together, they destroy the Titan's base of operations in space, the Gate of Zidane. Soon after, Soroko assassinates the Titan's leader, Jamatov, to take over, blaming the death on Hamon Khan to fuel the war effort. Amon decides she no longer needs the use of the AUG, and so the stage is now set for our final three-way confrontation. Camille and Amon duke it out, eventually connecting with each other as new types do. But contrary to one of the key features, we'll say, of new types, even though they can understand each other on a far deeper level, that doesn't necessarily mean they'll accept each other and stop fighting, with Haman in particular rejecting understanding in favour of war. But in the end, Camille doesn't feel the same way and cannot bring himself to take the shot on Haman when given the chance. Reflecting on this later, he 
tells Char that he feels his emotional state just couldn't surpass Man's overwhelming will. But Char refutes this, telling him that mindset, questioning himself and suppressing his emotions will only send him down the same road as Amaro. And it took him seven years to recover from that. But it's hard for Camille to do that and live up to these expectations Char has of him, especially when the gut punches just keep rolling in. Sarah, another new type in the Titans, was just killed by cats. And now of all things, Rosami enters the fray again. And Camille is forced to kill her to protect the Argama. At this point, how could you blame him from becoming more pessimistic? All these people he's tried to help just end up dying. He's tired, the war has taken its toll on him, and it's nearly time for Camille to rest. But not before a few more punches roll in. Now is the perfect time to quickly talk about cats. Remember I mentioned him for a brief moment back when I was talking about Amaro waking up? Yeah, th there are a lot of characters to keep track of in Zeta. I don't think I even mentioned Sarah yet. But this is where his character arc comes to a head. So what better time than I need to briefly mention him. And I really like what the guys at Weekly Suit Gundam say. Cats is basically a failed Gundam protagonist, with Camille acting as his role model, as at this point in the show, Camille doesn't need a mentor anymore and stands on his own two feet as a pilot. Katz nearly goes through the entire arc, you know? Traumatized kid gets into a mobile suit before he's ready, falls in love with another new type, Sarah, who tragically dies, and continues to fight in the ongoing war. But the reason he's a failed Gundam protagonist is because he never learns the lessons he needs to. Not everyone can be like Amuro and Camille, so when the wannabe hero gets in and out of his depth, he unfortunately bites the dust. And let's be real, if any of us thought about living in the Gundam universe and thought we'd be a protagonist, no you wouldn't, you'd be cats. But we aren't done yet, the punches continue to roll in. Captain Henkin and the entire Radish ship sacrifice themselves to save Emma. Jared has his fittingly unceremonious death and Camille is just pushing along, but he's clearly struggling. When he makes a quick rendezvous with Emma, the guy is so spaced out and exhausted he accidentally takes his helmet off while in the vacuum of space. Nonetheless, he pushes on, but the punches keep rolling in. As I mentioned before, Emma takes out Rokoa, but what I failed to mention is that Emma ends up fatally wounded as well. Camille tries his best to save her, but she isn't going to make it. And the last significant female role model he has in his life dies in his arms, with her final request being to absorb her life force and finally just put this war to an end. It might sound kind of weird, but that is a legitimate part of Camille's new type ability and the way that it interacts with the biosensor in the Zeta Gundam. That is a whole other rabbit hole to go down, but essentially his emotions can amp the Zeta's power and Emma saw that firsthand. And that final scene where Camille leaves her behind, taking her hopes and dreams with him and giving her his final Camille Bidan Ikimas with that broken, teary-eyed face is perfect. It is easily one of the greatest scenes in the entirety of Gundam. Her death and the build-up of him just sitting there with her body mourning, taking a goddamn break for a second before picking himself back up and finishing the fight like she wanted is just insanely good. It's hard for me to even describe in words the way it makes me feel but it's brilliant. Then we have our dramatic final battle inside the colony, where everyone decides to take a break from mecha fighting to have an ideological battle in a literal theatre. I guess the colony laser was a colony at one point after all. And the irony of it is, Char, Soroko, and Taman are all putting on an act. Worded far better than I could from this guy on Reddit six years ago, Soroko claims to only be a witness to history, yet was willing to scheme and kill his way to the top. Aman says she only wants to restore the Zabi family, yet it's clear she's only using Minerva to fuel her own ambition. And Char claims he's 
just waiting for new types to come around naturally. But in reality, he's just been running away from the issues in leading that type of growth. All three of them won't admit what they truly want and hide who they are. And to Camille on stage left who calls them out on their bullshit, spouting about how enough people have already died in this constant power struggle. Someone like Super Eye Patch Wolf could probably write an entire video on this theater scene because it really says a lot, but not me. So everyone's back in their mobile suits and Camille's basically borderline suicidal at this point. The colony laser is about to fire with them inside and he just wants to make sure he either kills Haman and Soroko there and now or forces them to all stay inside the laser so they die together. And it's only because of Char that he manages to make it out of there. All of Char's hope for a brighter future for space noids is envisioned with Camille leading the charge. He wants to put the future in his capable hands, but Camille sees things differently. He sees the way people respond to Char and instead he believes in him him, feeling as though his life is meaningless by comparison and that it should be Char leading the charge, literally telling him that he still has a job to do and that so many people died in this war believing in him and his words, so he can't die until he saves the world. Needless to say, Char doesn't agree, but that doesn't matter. Zeta takes all of the hope Char had in Camille to bring about a better future and crushes it. The kid is already at the end of his rope, but he takes everything he's got left with the combined power of his fallen comrades, channels that into the Zeta, and finally finishes off Sirocco by literally slamming the front of the Zeta into his cockpit. It's fucking brutal and gorgeously animated. And I wish I could say it was all over here, but it's not. In Sirocco's final breath, he swears to take Camille's soul with him. And in some crazy new type Yami Yugi style mind freak, he does just that. With Camille's mind now gone forever. The best Gundam protagonist that went through so much throughout Zeta and came out of it the strongest new type we have ever seen is reduced to a literal shell of his former self that has to be carried back by far. He was honestly an amazing character in her own right I didn't even get to talk about but we're coming to a close here. While I think what happened to Camille hurt far more than it would have if he just died, as a silver lining Camille Bidan can finally rest. The titans are no more, Char loses to Haman and dies. We all know that turns out. The AUG have taken a massive hit, losing so many of their key pilots and probably the most powerful pilot they've ever seen in Camille. And now it is Axis Zeon's turn to fill the power vacuum. Aman set the stage perfectly for her takeover, and we get to see how that pans out later on in ZZ. Double Zeta. So in the end, who really won here? That is the spectacular story of Zeta Gundam. Yep, it, it ends right there. And if you haven't watched it, I highly recommend you do. And if you have, I seriously recommend a rewatch. This isn't how I thought I would feel about the series, jumping into a rewatch to make this video. But man, that second viewing really changed a lot about how I feel about Zeta and really went to put everything into a different perspective. I still consider War in the Pocket my favorite Gundam story, but man, Zeta's really climbed up there. Hope you all enjoyed this one. Thank you so much for watching.